Okay, so I'm going to talk to you today about the efforts to clean up an infested nursery and establish a clean production system. You guys have just heard a little introduction to this new situation that we're dealing with here in California uh, with the Phytophthora tentaculata. So uh, as a result of that being found at the San Francisco Public Utilities site, a lot of activity has happened since then. Um, and a lot of the native plant nurseries and restoration nurseries are, are interested in figuring out how can we grow clean plants, how are we going to clean it up when we, if we get it, and there's a lot of questions. So I was asked to put something together uh, on this topic. I'd like to point out who the authors here are. Uh, my colleague Karen Seslow at the National Ornamental Research Site at Dominican, where we're doing research on Phytophthora remorum, P. tentaculata, and other pests. And also Diana Benner and Laura Hansen from the Watershed Nursery, who have been instrumental in uh, helping us move forward in getting the BMPs ready for the, for the native plant nurseries. So let me see if I can figure this out. Um, I don't want to belabor the Phytophthora remorum story too much, but it is something that happened a few years ago that really changed what we do in my world of regulatory plant pathology and how we regulate pathogens. And it became a real hot topic. Uh, just briefly, as you know, probably in 95, the tan oak started dying. It took us quite a while to figure out what it was, but um, Dave Rizzo figured out that Phytophthora remorum was the culprit. Um, it wasn't, and then about 2000, in that same year, we had one nursery found that had deposited plants with P. remorum. I think they were rhododendrons. And that prompted us to start looking throughout the whole state at all the nurseries for P. remorum. And even though we looked focused for that disease, we didn't find it in any of our nurseries, unfortunately. Because then in 2004, one nursery in Southern California was found with the disease and shipped well over 300,000 plants across the country that were potentially infected with the pathogen. So this caused a big furor and uproar and everyone is freaking out and very, very concerned about moving this pathogen on ornamental plants to the East Coast where it will get into the forest on the East Coast. And also for continued spread on the West Coast. So that's the year, that's sort of what happened at that nursery, the, 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 bag, the plants that were left were bagged up, millions of dollars of plant material were bagged and uh, buried at the landfill. So there was a lot of, um, I mean, this was a really important issue that was going on. And a lot of things happened as a result. Uh, one of them was the development of the National Ornamental Research Site that I mentioned earlier at Dominican, where we could actually do some work on Phytophthora remorum in a real world nursery setting as opposed to in a lab or in a greenhouse, which is where all the other work had been done. So we could start to get some really good answers. I didn't mean to click it to that one, but um, now I will. And one of the things that we have developed over there is some methods to clean up the soil on the ground. This was the number one priority for the nursery industry for Phytophthora morum. And uh, so we started implementing some some work over there at Dominican, and then we took it to the field, and we actually were able to decontaminate soil, dirt on the ground. As you can see, it's covered with gravel, and it's beaten in, and it's compacted, and everything. And the steaming that we did, the steam treatment, killed the pathogen down to 20 centimeters. Uh, the steaming methods have been uh, fine-tuned and improved since 2011. We have a new staff out there at Dominican than we did initially. So we have some, a new steaming team over there and they're fine tuning the process, getting it down to a really uh, good science, a really good uh, method. Another thing that we worked with over at Dominican is Dr. Tim Widmer from uh, the Agricultural Research Service at Fort Detrick, Maryland came out with his newly found species of trichoderma, and some of you may already know that trichoderma is a fungus. It lives in the soil, and it has a lot of uh, biological control activities. There's many species. 
Some of them are already incorporated in commercial products to uh, like Root Shield and um, I can't think of the other one right now. But So Tim brought his product out and we put it into the nursery under real nursery conditions again. This is ground that's been beaten down with gravel and dirt. And uh, in this particular study, it was the first one we did, we rototill half thinking maybe we have to rototill first or not, and we didn't rototill. He installed the trichoderma and uh, successfully killed all the pathogens in the soil. Uh, the phytophthora was gone and he didn't even find pythons in there. This particular species of trichoderma is actually attacks the fungus, where sometimes some of the trichodermas are just sort of competing with it or giving off a chemical maybe. I don't know, I'm not an expert in that, so don't quote me on that. But um, in this case, we do know that this pathogen, or the trichoderma attacks the pathogen, grows around it. We have microscopic pictures of it like eating at the fungus. So this worked very well. Um, the grower there at that nursery put a little fence, you can see in the lower right down there, to keep that place just, he didn't want to even take any risks. So he sectioned it off, didn't put any more plants in there, just let it be. I came back about six months later and the trichoderma was still there, doing quite well, no phytophthoras or anything. Today, the guy is now, uh, you know, plants are there and he's moved on. And in that same nursery, um, we also uh, did some solarization studies. Jennifer Park out of Oregon State University uh, has a multi-state project going where she's trying solarization of this. So we've done this now two years in a row at many nurseries throughout the whole state. I've, I've worked with her down in Southern California and we put some in the north and on the coast as well. And um, it works very well. You just have to have some sun and you have to have a little time. She actually had control within two weeks in some cases, but really it's more like a five week or probably a six week process. Um, we were burying the edges, now Jennifer came up with this new thing with these water tubes to help hold the tarp down. This is where that anti-condensation film came from that uh, Ellen mentioned earlier. Uh, Jennifer Park sort of found that for us all and uh, that's the best stuff for use for solarizing. Clear, not black. Um, dirty pots, I threw this in, it's sort of a little bit out of sequence maybe, but uh, it's segueing into where we're going next um, in my talk. It's become very clear to me, um, working with the native plant nurseries in the last six months, and also working with ornamental nurseries, the big guys that ship all over the world. They reuse their pots. They do not clean them before reusing them. People will collect pots from unknown sources. I have people say, yeah, we'll go around the neighborhood and collect pots from, from other landscape jobs. They don't know where they've come from. They don't know what was in them. They don't know if the plant that was in it was dead or alive. This is a hugely risky practice. And I found out very recently that it is something that's practiced in the native uh, plant nurseries and the restoration nurseries as well. So I, I just want to really emphasize that what is rising to the top on the Phytophthora tentaculata issue that is showing up in numerous nurseries. I'm visiting another one tomorrow, yet another nursery. So. They all are sharing their pots. They're all using dirty pots. The ornamental guys are using dirty pots. This is something I really think we need to think about. Dirty pots are a very, what we call a major critical control point in order to stop the introduction and also the spread of disease in your nursery. Um, so with that in mind, uh, the gentleman who has the nursery that we're doing all these studies in, <laughs> steaming trichoderma and solarizing. He's such a wonderful guy. He's out in the San Joaquin Valley and he himself talked to me about, couldn't we try this with pots? So in the last few years, we've been fine tuning our study little by little. This, this is uh, the left-hand picture is um, the first study that we did a year ago and a year and a half. And then he came up with a better idea and built these racks here. 
But we bag up the, bot, the pots and we leave them in the sun for a month. We rotate them if, if we have more pots. We kind of roll them around if it's not just one sleeve of, of pots. And, and Jesse, the, the nursery owner, he wanted very much to try pots that were not in plastic at all. Because his feeling was that that might be enough to kill it right there, just lay the pots in the heat. So uh, the first year's study, this one, I've looked at the results, I haven't really tabulated them, and we, we achieved the required temperatures to kill Phytophthora morum, which we're pretty sure kills Tentaculata, and I also heard Tom Gordon mention earlier the same, 50 degrees centigrade for 30 minutes that kills most of our Phytophthoras. We reach those temperatures time and time again over the period of the month. So I, we're really, really optimistic about this. I haven't been able to tabulate the results from this year's study, but uh, the nursery owner um, has a production pole idea in mind where you start a pot at one end, get it in the sun, and it would roll down the rack, and by the time it got to the other end, it would be ready for use. You know, we'd figure out how many days that had to be. So that's where we're going with that, and um, it's pretty exciting, I think particularly if we can figure out that it's easy to clean these pots, that would be a really, really good thing for us to do. Are they at least washing the pot off so there's no dirt on it? Who is that? The, the nursery, what's the pot? This, this nursery here? Yeah, are they washing the pot? And no one's washing, very few people seem to be washing pots. So this guy does not wash his pots. That's soil, okay, soil on the pot. Soil on the pot. And you saw my other picture. The, the pile on the left, the big pile, that's from a gigantic interstate shipping nursery. This is the nursery that told me they go around the neighborhood and collect pots from anywhere. They'll take pots. They want pots. They're expensive. And they also tell me it's too expensive to wash them. And, um, but yet then I'll go to some nurseries, because I've got about 15 ornamental plant nurseries in my best management practice program which is what this is going to be about. And um, some of them do have a full-on pot washing set. They recognize the value. And I hope you all can recognize the value too, because really, again, I'm working, I'm buried up to here with this pen, P. tentaculata issue. And um, the thing that keeps rising to the top, and, and we're trying to figure out how it got in, how it's moving around, what the heck is going on with this, it's everyone's sharing pots and everyone's using dirty pots. And I'm afraid that might be part of it. Did you give me a signal yet? No, okay. All right, so let me, let me buzz through this. So as a result of Phytophthora mora being such a hot topic across the country and, and, and very much of a concern um, because it can move on ornamental plants and it could be put in a truck and driven to the eastern coast where it could get in the Appalachian forest or you know they have hardwood forests back there. So um, in order to try and give some guidance to our nurseries and also some reassurance to our trading partners, the people who buy our plants, um, a group of us sat down together and put together this, this document here. And we came up with it. Um, it was a group of us that put it together, but then we went and took it out. And we based it, our NAPO is the NAP, uh, Nash, what is it? <laughs> uh, hmm. North American Plant Protection Organization, and it's our uh, plant protection manuals, and they talk about propagative stock and requirements, and so that's what the RSPM thing is. That's an internationally recognized standard for propagation and pro for propagative stock. Um, we took it to the industry, we took it to universities, we took it to the, all the state departments of agriculture, we took it to the federal government, and even Canada was involved. And everybody took a look at this list of BMPs that we developed, and, and we all finally agreed on it and put it together in this manual, and that's the manual that we use in our program. And I'm sorry I didn't bring one today, but the picture you just saw, that's the cover in the right-hand corner, and it's a three-ring binder. And I'm gonna give you some examples in a minute of, excuse me, of what's inside. So 
What are best management practices? I don't think I really need to tell you guys, but let's do it anyway. Oh, really? Oh, okay, we gotta go fast. So, um, they're just good phytosanitary practices. You all know it, clean up the, sweep up the debris, don't have it in standing water, uh, you know, scout your plants for disease and remove them from the block if they're diseased. Um, why do we do it? We wanna protect the landscape. We want to protect our trade. Uh, we just like healthy plants. We want to have healthy, vigorously growing plants. I have to go fast because I only have one minute and I, I guess it was going longer. Um, our manual is basically made up of these categories. Uh, management of moisture, your nursery layout, training, record keeping. And so what we do is go and we sit down with you in your nursery and we talk about what do you grow and what are the pests of concern to you you want to review your layout. You want to not increase the risk to yourself. You know, if you're if you're growing right under bay laurel trees, probably don't want to grow pea remoran posts. I mean, that's increasing your risk. This fellow on the right put a, a was trying to protect his plants from the surrounding forest, and in essence, he created a big moisture chamber, and the disease just went crazy inside. So you have to know your know your pathogen. Now I'm gonna flip through really fast. These are the pages out of our manual. And what we do is go through and talk to you about what, what best management practices would work for you. What needs do you have? And every, every, every program is customized to your nursery and your needs and what you grow. Use clean pots, that's a best management practice. Use clean soil, know where it's coming from. Ask your supplier where the dirt is coming from. Uh, monitor plants and propagated material incoming. That is how it's gonna get into your nursery. You know, that's the best defense is don't let it in in the first place. Be really, really critical on what you're, what you're bringing in. Um, uh, someone showed a picture earlier about cleaning your shoes on your way in. That's really important. This thing is carried in mud. And if you have trucks that deliver stuff to your nursery or to your site, the debris in the truck could potentially carry a pathogen. Don't let them sweep the debris out at your site. Um, again, these are the components that our manual is composed of. There's many manuals out there. Um, it's also called clean stock production. It's called a systems approach to production, best management practice, and Oregon calls it best cultural practices. If you Google any of those things, you're gonna get a ton of information on what it is we're talking about. And it basically, it's producing clean plants, starting clean, keeping clean, and you, and you heard Ellen earlier talk about they, people are following all the rules and they're still getting disease. And it's very frustrating and it's sort of the nature of plant diseases, unfortunately. But the best we can do is this kind of stuff where we, we check our nurseries, look at the critical control points where things would be coming in, prevent them from coming in in the first place. Here's a website where you can go to uh, get the best management practice manual online. And now I'm gonna really go fast because I'm not over my time probably, but um, I wanna give thanks to uh, Diana and Laura for jumping in with both feet. They've had no, no problems at their nursery whatsoever. And they have had, they got wind of the P. tentaculata issue. And they contacted us and said, please come and we want to develop a best management practice program and be proactive and prevent anything from coming in in the first place. And that's really the best way, I'm just so thrilled with with how all of you, your whole industry has stepped up to the plate to do things. And, and Diana and Laura have made all these changes in their nursery to, we went in and we talked about where the critical control points are and where they can make some changes to prevent disease spread and introduction. And that's it, thank you.